Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're going to start now. Thank you very much. This is the public hearing on the Committee of the Whole. The purpose of this public hearing is to hear the testimony on Resolution 140869. The clerk, please read the title of the resolution. Resolution 140869, entitled Resolution Authorizing City Council's Committee of the Whole to hold hearings to fully explore opportunities to further establish the Philadelphia region as an energy hub. Thank you very much, Ms. Lewis. Um, we will now call up our first witnesses. Uh, for our first witnesses today, we would ask that Mark Steer, Andre Butler, Stan Shapiro, and Melissa Robbins please come up to the table. Good morning. Uh, good morning, President Clark, okay. uh, members of council. Um, Andre and, and Gwen aren't here yet, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll get their testimony in the record. Okay, please state your name for the record. My name is Mark Steer. Um, I want to thank you for uh, making these hearings available to us. Uh, my testimony is available in writing, but I want to say a few words here and be happy to take some pe questions. I'm sure, you, as you know, this body has been criticized by people who stand for the principles of good government, they say for its failure to hold hearings on Mayor Nuttall's proposal to sell uh, the gas works to UIL. Since the hearings uh, that began yesterday and continue today were announced some time ago, I've had a suspicion that the real purpose of that criticism has been to badger council into agreeing to the sale of PGW without actually fully addressing the issue of whether the sale is a good idea. Uh, so that's what I want to speak about today. And as you know, I've been a supporter of the principles of good government for a long time. I seem to remember some years ago testifying here when one member of council actually called me a goo goo. Um, so uh, I, I think I have some standing to speak about what, what, what good government principles say about uh, this deal. Now one principle of good government is transparency. And I think before the mayor or council makes a decision about this, we need to know exactly what the proposal contains. And unfortunately, m many of the uh, news articles and, and remarks by the administration about the proposal have been somewhat misleading. Uh, we keep hearing about $400 million going into the pension fund, and yet, um, and, and that reducing the amount that the city would have to contribute per year by about $40 million, yet, that doesn't take into account the, 22 million, uh, the $18 million a year that the city gets from PGW now, which has a present value of about $200 million. So um, th the amount of money going to the pension fund is a lot less than people have been saying. Moreover, if you look at what proponents of the sale say the money could be used for, there seems to be a lot of double counting. I've read newspaper articles that say that the reduction in the contribution the city makes to the pension fund could be used for education, parks and recreation, all things we need. Uh, and then I've also said, people say, it'll, it will advance the time in which we cover 80, per, we get to 80% of the long-term liability for pension covered by five or 10 years. Unfortunately, you can't use the money for both things. And so it seems to me there's some double cutting, double counting, uh, unless we're gonna sell the PG, PGW twice to two different people and not let them know what we're doing. Um, now let's step back and look at the deal as a whole. Um, it looks like an exchange of one asset, PGW, for another, for a uh, big infusion of money. But the asset's valuable to UIL only because it can raise gas rates paid by Philadelphians and charge, change who pays them. Now, I'm not a sophisticated financial thinker, but if I had $1.86 billion a year, a billion dollars to invest in something, I don't think I'd buy an entity that returns $18 million in surplus. Doesn't seem like a good deal to me. Unless I could figure out a way to raise that amount of, raise the amount of money PGW returns by a great deal. 
Now, they've suggested a number of ways in which they could do that. One is to ex expand operations, and we heard yesterday that there are ways for PGW to bring in much more money. Those are all good things to do, I believe, or many of them are, yet they can be done now, so there's no net benefit for, for the city of, of having a, a, a private as opposed to the public entity, perhaps with a public-private partnership doing that. They talk about combining operations, yet when you look at the overall scope of an entity like PGW, saving some billing expenses in the back room is a small part of its operations. And besides which, the savings don't just go to PGW, but would go to UIL's entities in, in Connecticut. Um, implicit in what they're saying is cuts to wages and benefits, yet as we've already heard, the employees of PGW are paid less than comparative workers in the private sector. It's not clear that, that there's that much room for savings there. And besides which, I think th th we need to be very careful about reducing the skill and, uh, of the employees of PGW. Um, all of us who live through the deregulation of telephone service know that along with decreased costs and all the great things our phones can do, we've had a decline in, in service. Our phones do everything now except make phone calls reliably. Uh, we can't afford an unreliable PGW that's more dangerous to us. Uh, and that is one of the things that might happen if, if we replace the current workers with new, uh, less skilled, less paid, less well paid workers. Um, they talk about speeding up gas main replacement, and although that may be a good idea uh, in, in the long run, the long-term costs of doing it are actually higher if we privatize PGW than if we keep it a public entity. So where does that leave us? It leaves us uh, with the need to drastically increase uh, PGW's gas rates uh, in order to, to, for this deal to be a good one for UIL. Um, now, the first thing we'd probably do is, is uh, tackle the eight, 80 million subsidy that we provide to low-income and senior homeowners. Um, and, but it may need to go beyond that. It may need to raise our rates beyond that. And as I said, I'm not an expert in this field, but I actually looked at what the experts said, and I looked at a report that a company called Black & Veatch uh, put out a little while ago. Uh, they're one of the major uh, consultants to the energy industry, and they're actually a consultant to UIL. And in, in a report called Gas Utility Mergers Has the Time Come, on page two they say, at some points, gas rates will have to dramatically rise to cover debt service on the acquisitions, regardless of where the financing comes from. Starting with low base rates provides flexibility in minimizing customer impact via the structure and timing of the eventual rate increases. Problem is, and we in Philadelphia don't start with low base rates but high ones. Dramatic increases will be devastating for our citizens. So that's the first thing. I don't think this deal has been totally transparent, and we, we don't know we don't have a really good idea where the costs are going to fall, although if we look into it, it looks like it's going to fall on, on our citizens. Um, second point is that, uh, as far as good government principles is, that when you have a general obligation, like pensions, like education, like parks, they should be paid for by general taxes that fall on everyone, real estate taxes, sales taxes, wage taxes. The problem here is if rates really are going to go up, if we're actually really going to pay a great deal more, so, in effect, what this transaction means is that the long-term pension costs of the city are going to be paid by gas rate payers. And that's, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's no good government principle that says you put all the burden of paying for pensions on one group of people. We wouldn't raise water rates to pay for pensions. Uh, we wouldn't raise parking rates to pay for pensions. Why would we raise gas rates to do so? And the, the final point I want to say is that uh, an important good government pr principle is progressive taxation. Uh, we believe that people should pay their taxes according to the ability to do so. Um, and one of the things that we've, in fact, been able to do through PGW some rates is something we can't do uh, because of the uniformity clause. We actually created a progressive rate structure where uh, citizens in the, in, in, in the low-income program pay gas rates based on family size and on the proportion of their income. Uh, and seniors get a discount. That's a really good thing. That's a great thing the city does. You know, there's a large literature on utility regulation by, by political scientists and econom economists. I haven't read it all, but reviews I've read suggest that utility prices are almost always too high. If you have a privately owned entity, the beneficiaries of high rates are the investors. If you have a publicly owned utility, the beneficiaries of high rates tend to be the workers. Um, if I had to take a choice between those two things, I'd choose the workers. But what we have in Philadelphia is a, a, a something different, something fairly unique. 
where we've used our relatively high rates to benefit low-income people and seniors. And that, I think, is a really distinctive thing about Philadelphia. It's something we should be proud of. It's a way we break the mold from other cities, and I see no reason to change it from the point of view of good government principles. So in conclusion, it, it seems to me if you look at the proposed PGW sale from good government principles, what you find out, it's basically a financial transaction of the dubious kind that we've seen too much of in this country for many years. It shuffles assets and around in a way that de will deliver far less and cost far more than is promised. The investment bankers will do well. Uh, working people and the poor will do badly. It's not a free lunch for the city, but a hidden tax that falls on some, on, narrowly on some of us and most heavily on the poor. And I urge you to reject it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good morning, Good President morning. Clark, members of City Council. I thank you for this opportunity to testify about the future of Philadelphia Gas Works on behalf of the Southeastern Chapter of Americans for Democratic Action. ADA does not at, at present have a position on many of the issues oh, that will be discussed. At, I'm at sorry. This. I'm sorry. Just state your name for the record, please. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Melissa Robbins. It's okay. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. So as I was saying, ADA at this present time does not have uh, a position on many of the issues that will be discussed at this hearing. We are here along with many other citizens who are in this room or who will read about it, what is said, or who will listen and learn. But we do have two contributions to make at this time. One about the process by which we are considering the future of PGW, and one about the goals of the city as it considers alternative futures for PGW. Our first point is that while these hearings are welcome, they and other such events should have been held long ago. We join with many other progressive groups in saying that the decisions about how PGW might best serve the various goals of the citizens of Philadelphia, including whether to sell PGW, should be thoroughly debated here in this room, in other public forums, in the newspapers, and blog posts, and in social media, and in meetings of community groups and advocacy organizations. Democracy does not just mean that elective representatives act but that they act after a thorough public vetting of alternatives before them. So far, this has not happened. And in saying this, I should empathize that we are not just criticizing City Council for failing to hold timely public hearings on the mayor's proposal to sell PGW. There has been a failure at all levels of government, including the mayor's office, Nothing actually stopped the mayor from providing far more information about the proposed sale and its consequences, both the council and public long, long ago. Nothing stopped the mayor from holding a public forum of his own about the future of PGW or council from holding general hearings about the future of PGW months ago. And looking at what the public is actually not received from the mayor or from the concentric report to council, there is still much information we need to answer and the many questions citizens will rightfully have about PGW and its future. And that brings me to the substantive point I wish to raise. We at ADA believe that whatever decision is made about PGW, it is imperative that PGW or its successor protect the programs that keep rates low for seniors and those with low incomes. PGW has, as we all know, had its troubles over the years. But one thing that PGW, under the direction of the mayor and members of council, has done well is protect our fellow citizens most, need, most in need from devastating gas rates that PGW has managed to fix the economic difficulties of the enterprise without compromising these programs is a huge achievement and one we should celebrate and not denigrate. Philadelphia has one of the highest rates of home ownership of any city in America. It is one of the highest rates of home ownership by seniors of any city in America. These achievements have been made possible in part by PGW's senior citizen discount called the SCD program, which offers a 20% discount for seniors and its community responsibility program, the CRP, which limits the charge for natural gas based on family, family size and the ability to pay. These two programs are supplemented by PGW's Enhanced Low Income Retrofit Program, which helps CRP customers reduce their energy use. 
These programs are expensive. Together, they cost PGW $80 million a year. And on top of them, PGW has for many years had a policy of foreclosing on property liens for non-payment of service. I'm sorry? Oh, well, not foreclosing, rather. I'm sorry. Forgive me. These programs are costly, and the burden for them falls to some extent on other citizens. But because Philadelphia is unable to enact truly progressive taxation, they are a critical part of our city's effort to serve and protect low-income and senior citizens. PGW and Philadelphia is distinctive in part because of these programs, and thus we at ADA would be concerned about any proposal to sell PGW that would threaten them. And that brings me back to my first point. Even after the information we have received from the mayor and city council, Philadelphians know too little about what to expect both from PGW, if it continues as is, or from UIL, if it purchases PGW. We need to know about what revenues the gas works will need under both a public and private future. Any pressure to increase revenues will not only lead to higher gas rates, but will threaten the SCD and CRP programs. We need projections of revenues, rates, and programs beyond three years in order to know whether any sale of PGW makes sense. Those projections must exist. No city would expect to secure a huge amount of money from an asset like PGW, and no company would decide to invest $1.86 billion to purchase a company without long-term projections about the revenues needed to support the enterprise and the gas rates needed to generate those revenues. But we can find nothing in the public documents that contain such projections. Without such projections, and perhaps even with them, we need hard and fast, legally enforceable guarantees that PGW will not turn away from the policies that have protected seniors and low-income citizens from devastating gas rates. Thank you for allowing me to speak on this issue on the behalf of the Southeastern Chapter of Americans for Democratic Action. Thank you very much for your testimony. Good morning, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Council, uh, Council President. My name is Stan Shapiro, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Philadelphia Move On Council and Philadelphia Neighborhood Networks. The question of how to use the People's Gas Works in the most cost-effective, environmentally appropriate manner is complicated and worthy of a level of attention I frankly haven't yet had the chance to give it. I do certainly hope and trust that whatever course is charted, it's consistent with council resolutions that have recognized the danger that Marcellus shale drilling represents the city's water supply. But the main thing I want to do today is to lay out our view of why this council did exactly the right thing in sending the administration's privatization proposal to the ash heap of history. Frankly, too many people in government, and especially the press, fetishize the private sector. Certainly, private enterprise has had a major role in the growth and development of our nation. But the corporate sector has one overriding goal, the relentless pursuit of profits. That's why on the private sector's ledger we find so many predatory actions over the years which, while profitable, have literally put at risk the fate of the planet and everyone who lives on it. Here's just a small part of what we see on that ledger. Global warming, polluted air and water, a banking crisis that almost destroyed and may yet destroy our economy, a healthcare system that's the most expensive in the world and which, before Obamacare, left millions without coverage of any kind, a prison industrial complex that works ceaselessly to lock away more and more of our youth, an armaments industry that has lobbied to elevate the Second Amendment to the level of one ordained by heaven while turning our cities into battle zones. And I could go on. Just think tobacco, the military-industrial complex, monopolistic price-fixing, income inequality, the worst, the worst and most expensive internet system in the industrialized world, and on and on and on I could go. Thankfully, with PGW in public hands, it will not be used as a tool to advance profits before the interests of the people of our city. Indeed, to date, as has been pointed out by previous speakers, it has been exemplary in pursuing the public's welfare not of the already fabulously rich. Management of PGW and this council 
understand the weight of poverty in our city, and PGW has adopted programs to assure that no one loses their right to one of the essentials of, light, of life, heat, because of limited means. It has been a leader in weatherization and energy conservation through programs like efficient home rebates. It has fostered programs to help homeless families and youth. It helps minority women and disabled own companies through its procurement policies. Finally, it employs Philadelphia residents and pays them a decent wage with decent retirement benefits. Good paying jobs are a cornerstone of a healthy economy that lifts all Philadelphians up. That is the job of PGW. It will not be the job of a private entity which buys PGW for its own ends. So we've already heard, I'm not gonna repeat uh, Mark's uh, incisive comments about uh, the likely end result of privatization in terms of costs to city residents. Uh, we can borrow at tax exempt rates, private entities cannot. Uh, we do not ask for additional rate hikes because of improvements to the system uh, that uh, require profits being paid to shareholders. A private entity will do this. So private, privatizing PGW would have been a lose-lose proposition. I, we want to thank council for terminating this pr proposal with prejudice. Now we proceed to develop an energy program with PGW in its forefront that works for Philadelphians, not the 1%. Thank you, members of council. Thank you very much for your testimony. Any questions of these witnesses by members? There being none, thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we will have Charlie Ryan representing Liberty Energy Trust and John Henry from Chariot Companies. Morning. Good morning. Just state your name for the record. My name is John Henry. I'm the chairman and founder of Chariot Companies, and next to me is Dr. Cecilia Cardesa Lusardi. She's our chief strategy officer. Charlie Ryan with Liberty Energy Trust, and to my left is Boris Brevnov, also with Liberty Energy Trust. <coughs> Charlie Ryan with Liberty Energy Trust, and to my left is Boris Brevnov, also with Liberty Energy Trust. Thank you. You can proceed with your testimony. First, I want to thank uh, you, President, uh, Council President Clark, and the entire City Council for the opportunity to share Liberty Energy Trust's ideas for developing Philly into a leader in the next generation energy economy. As I said, my name's Charlie. I'm a partner at Liberty Energy Trust, I'm here with Boris, also a partner. And while I grew up here, I've spent the last 25 years working around the globe on energy and infrastructure issues, including helping governments and utilities modernize and expand their capabilities. Boris spent his entire career in the energy and finance sectors. Uh, his most recent relevant experience was in Chicago with the People's Energy Corporation, a company with many of the same challenges and opportunities present in PGW, but with one important exception. People's Gas is not located 100 miles from the largest gas production site in the world or located in a city like Philadelphia that's naturally positioned to play a leadership role in tomorrow's energy economy. Together, he and I assembled a team with significant experience in ownership, management, and operation of gas downstream and midstream assets. Uh, Liberty is backed by Philadelphia area individuals, institutions with a proven commitment to the city and its stakeholders and we've raised close to $2 billion in private capital for this project. I want to start my testimony by recognizing that Philadelphia wouldn't have this opportunity if it wasn't for the impressive transformation and turnaround of PGW over the last decade. Everyone in the city owes these people who are responsible for that turnaround a great debt of thanks. We also believe that Mayor Nutter deserves credit for moving this important conversation forward, and in particular, City Council deserves credit for being willing to analyze the details, to explore the different options, and to think about PGW in a broader strategic context. This is a too important an opportunity to miss, but it really does require care and diligence, which we think will be vital to getting to the right solution. So others before me detailed why Philadelphia has an opportunity to be a leader in the next generation energy economy. 
I won't repeat what they've all said, but I do want to note two things. I believe that other regions that are already seizing the opportunity this new energy economy presents do not have the strengths that the Philadelphia region has. But to exploit these strengths, as you've heard from the discussion yesterday, and to really turn Philly into an energy hub, we do actually need to change the status quo. And we feel that the way to do that is introduce significant amounts of private capital and private sector experience and initiative. If done correctly, a public-private partnership would allow Philly to attract that capital and expertise while retaining control over PGW and its social programs. We also believe it would allow the city to receive a significant payment that could even be higher than the net proceeds of an outright sale, and at the same time continue protecting consumers, vulnerable customers, and add rather than reduce the number of critical employees and job opportunities. The city can benefit from the upside of growth in a way that a traditional asset sale will not allow. So there, there are two ways to realize value from an asset like PGW. A traditional asset sale where value is extracted through monetizing, that is reducing critical jobs and essential community programs, and one focusing on creating value through expansion and economic development. We believe a plan focused on economic development is the best option for Philadelphia, and Liberty Energy Trust is ready to implement such a plan. Creating value through economic development will require a true partnership between the public asset private capital, and the community. So call that a P3. The P3 we're proposing would bring together capital and for the first time on a project like this, organize labor. As Liberty has engaged with labor, we found that they not only shared our vision, our vision, but that labor through the union life insurance company was willing to invest alongside us. That is unprecedented. The P3 option will also bring in leading global infrastructure investors willing to commit capital, expertise, and their worldwide network of relationships. That's critical because there's no way that Philadelphia or any city can take advantage of this opportunity uh, or that PGW can be the centerpiece of a regional energy center without, we feel, this private capital. A P3 would have to build on PGW's strengths, a strong operational team, a trusted relationship with the city, and a solid A credit rating. It is actually interesting to note that the least expensive way to access, access debt capital markets today would be through PGW, more less expensive than through any other entity involved in this process. I'd like to note that the mayor's process did produce some impressive bids. The interest expressed is a vote of confidence in the role that the city of Philadelphia and PGW can play in the future energy economy. But I respectfully submit that the city focus not only on net proceeds the city in the near term, but also think about the potential multiplier effect on job creation in the city economy of a more strategic approach. The sale of PGW should not be about reducing the critical workforce. Not only does a reduction in labor mean there are fewer people paying taxes, but it likely harms the very pension system that the entire sale is meant to support. It's already been reported by the news media that the unfunded liability in PGW's pension plan can more than double with the push for early retirement of critical PGW employees. City controller warned, suppose it comes back to the gas workers' pension fund would eat up all the profit and more, so we actually sell it at a loss. In other words, if not done correctly, the city might suffer a net economic loss on a sale. We feel strongly that a different path forward under P3 would not only avoid the risk of an economically unattractive sale, but more importantly, offer a way forward to job creation and investment, a way forward that protects key stakeholders, gives the city participation in the future growth, provides for new investment, creating jobs, providing less expensive clean energy to existing and new entrants to the local economy. So we've been focused on this partnership approach. We have the experience and capital to get it done. That's why such a diverse group of local and international investors who previously had not invested in the city agreed to join up with Liberty. The investor group includes some of our area's leading investors, foundations, and philanthropists who believe, as we do, that Philadelphia should take this strategic approach and create an energy hub, and that there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. We don't want to outsource the solution to an outside group. Ours is a plan built around Philadelphia. It's owned and managed by Philadelphians for the benefit of the city. We've also brought in some of the largest energy experts in the world. And we'd partner with labor and the city in any, any version of the project. It's a different way of looking at things, but we think a unique opportunity like this deserves a unique approach. So talk a little bit more in conclusion about this P3, this public-private partnership. What we'd envisage is a new entity funding PGW's growth. The city would retain participation in the upside from the investment, a voice in governance, and a veto to protect critical community programs. There are many elements to it, but we feel it's clear that the net proceeds of the city, the actual amount of revenue the city receives from such a partnership would be greater than a simple sale. 
the P3 could utilize LNG facilities in ways that PGW cannot, just as was discussed yesterday. Transportation needs don't stay within a city's boundaries. They require a regional network. A modest 10% market share uh, uh, in the uh, replacement of diesel for trucks in the Delaware Valley would create an economic gain on the order of $170 million a year. Everyone agrees that CNG is the fuel of the future, but PGW doesn't have the access to capital to fund the infrastructure. Liberty recently joined with the Pennsylvania Public Private Partnership Board in their process seeking private partners to develop CNG fueling stations at public transit agencies around the state. Under this program, the private partner will design, build, finance, operate, and maintain CNG filling stations at up to 37 transit facilities. Each fueling site would provide access to CNG for public transit and private CNG vehicles alike. The model is a public-private partnership. Another opportunity for public-private partnership would be with the PRPA. As I'm sure you probably are aware, there's a process underway. And to quote Chairman Charles Kopp, the ideal development for Southport would be a combination energy port and marine terminal. Energy port is the enlightened vision for the future of Southport. The marine terminal carries forward the long tradition of port operations in Philadelphia. Liberty would like to bring PGW into this kind of P3 development. Another opportunity for investment through a P3 is in the critical air of replacing cast iron pipes. The primary reason to do so remains safety. However, a network modernization and replacement of pipes could also facilitate high pressure gas delivery, which in turn would allow new investment into combined heat and power plants. These new CHPs could save small businesses, schools, industry millions of dollars and create economic development opportunities around the city. All these developments are recommended by the excellent report prepared by your consultant, Concentric. As they put it, PGW should consider partnering with a private entity that could bring capital and marketing competencies to the opportunity while accepting a portion of the risks. Now it's time to put this report into action. Each of these opportunities naturally create new and growing demand for sustainable gas supply, which means demand for a pipeline infrastructure that could also be financed by private capital. Any of these alone could be implemented and would create alignment with an asset that an asset sale would not. But when combined under a P3, they could create an environment for innovation the country hasn't seen since Philadelphia was the industrial capital of the world 100 years ago. I stated previously, Philadelphia is uniquely positioned, but we don't have a monopoly in the opportunities arising from Marcellus development. It's clear others recognize Marcellus's opportunity and there's a rapid acceleration of development. Philadelphia needs to be in the leadership role. Other areas are already moving forward. Baltimore, even closer to home, Marcus Hook. I strongly believe that Philadelphia can add value to the vast resources of Marcellus and do it in a way that's socially and environmentally sustainable. Liberty would like to join in this effort to unite the community with capital, <coughs> labor, entrepreneurs, initiative and experience, and with PGW. So thank you very much for uh, inviting us to speak today, and we're looking forward to answering questions. Good morning. Good morning. Please proceed. I want to express my appreciation and gratitude to President Clark and all members of City Council for allowing me the opportunity to discuss Jarrett's company's mission, vision, and work as you consider positioning Philadelphia as an energy hub. At this time, I will begin to read my testimony into the record and then make myself available for questions. As the domestic natural gas and, and energy economy expands, Philadelphia, with its world-class transportation infrastructure, all located on the doorstep of Pennsylvania's new energy frontier, is ideally positioned to become a global energy hub. Given these statistics, it's not a matter of whether Philadelphia will become an energy hub, but rather when and how it chooses to do it and which Philadelphians are allowed to share in the benefits of that success. Chariot believes that societal needs, not just self-interested economic motives, can and should define markets. And ignoring societal needs can create externalities. All too often, companies, and indeed we as a society, have missed opportunities to address fundamental societal needs and failed to recognize how societal harms and unmet needs affect value chains. Myopically focusing solely on narrowly defined economic interests of the few fails to recognize the bigger economic picture affecting the many, overlooking the profound effect that location and other factors can have on productivity and innovation at a societal level. The trickle-down effect to these communities does not, does not and has not moved the needle sufficiently. The only way to move that needle is through participation and having a seat at the table. In Chariot's view, not all profit is equal. Profit with a social purpose represents a higher form of capitalism, 
one that creates a sustainable, positive cycle of company and community prosperity. A public-private partnership with PGW can facilitate the participation of low-wealth communities, creating opportunities to unlock the vast potential, not only of PGW, but of the low-wealth communities that PGW serves. Such an approach will help ensure needed private sector investment in PGW, with benefits not just to those investors and to PGW, but also to a whole host of low-wealth residents, minority and women-owned, and other small businesses. Instead of a one-off sale of PGW in its entirety, Cherry urges City Council to consider our shared value creation model. To be clear, shared value is not charity, nor is it about subordinating economics to social responsibility and sustainability. Rather, it is a new way to achieve economic success. Shared value is not on the margin of what Chariot does, but goes to the core of who we are. By understanding the broader economic forces at play around PDW and the complexities and progression of the supply chain itself, City Council could holistically direct employment opportunities to regional businesses and manufacturers sourced by low wealth communities, thereby generating positive economic activity in energy related industries and the Philadelphia region as a whole. Before I continue, let me briefly introduce Chariot. Chariot is a diversified, mission-based, minority-owned community development entity headquartered in Philadelphia with five core business platforms focused on revitalizing low-wealth communities throughout the United States. As a part of our social impact business model, 20% of our net profits from each operating company are invested into the Philadelphia Foundation to provide unrestricted operating grants to nonprofits serving our community. Our mantra is, when we grow, the community grows. I invite everyone to browse through our websites to learn more about our stakeholder strategy and work. Our team includes individuals with extensive expertise in energy, infrastructure, finance, investment banking, real estate, and mergers and acquisition matters, as well as respected academic, community, civil rights, and religious leaders. Our level of credibility and community awareness is respected from the boards to the barrios and from Kensington to Capitol Hill. We understand the underlying social conditions and the importance of developing a comprehensive view of the problem, the people affected, the barriers to progress, the options for driving change, and the parties that can help by providing the right product. Chariot Companies has been championing its shared value approach to, make, to making Philadelphia an energy hub since 2011. Significant growth in the Marcellus Shale industry in the next decade will infuse parallel growth in industries essential for the functioning of the entire business ecosystem. A report by the Institute for Energy Research indicates that Pennsylvania now ranks third in natural gas production behind only Texas and Louisiana. In September 2014, Pennsylvania added 17,800 jobs, the second highest number in the United States behind Texas. It's important to note that workers in the oil and gas industry enjoy wages that are much higher than those who work in peer industries. The average natural gas industry wage is $76,900 compared to the average household income of $50,400. Nearly 235,000 Pennsylvanians are employed directly or indirectly within Marcellus Shale related industries. According to a 2014 report by minorities and women, on minorities and women by the American Petroleum Institute, nearly 1.3 million direct job opportunities will come online between 2010 and 2012, considering all types of job growth. Of these job opportunities, African American and Hispanic workers are projected to account for nearly 410,000 jobs, uh, or 32% in 2030. An estimated 60% of energy sector job growth will occur in skilled and technical jobs, requiring up to two years post high school training. These jobs are often overlooked in efforts to, to promote science, technology, engineering, and math education. Moreover, 75% of all the oil and gas industry's direct workforce is comprised of, comprised of occupations that require little formal or post-secondary education and relatively few trade certifications. Instead, these jobs depend heavily on the experience-driven skills and knowledge unique to the natural gas industry. The drivers for increased workforce demand in blue-collar and semi-skilled jobs are due to, among other things, a retiring workforce and rapid expansion of energy production in the United States. 
To this end, Chariot has been working to develop Chariot Labs as a mean of coalescing a knowledge-based community around post-secondary education as well as traditional STEM-based curricula. Chariot Labs is a proposed 20,000 square foot state-of-the-art innovation facility that will be located in the Allegheny West section of North Philadelphia. It is part of a $260 million redevelopment project consisting of 1.2 million square feet and is estimated to create more than 2,000 temporary jobs and nearly 1,900 ongoing permanent jobs. Chariot Labs will develop knowledge-based workforce development programs by bringing non-traditional partners together within an integrated community thereby diversifying Philadelphia's regions, the Philadelphia region's economic base by promoting research, education, and technical, technological innovation and fostering collaborative and strategic alliances between varied industries to provide a narrowly tailored science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, STEAM, enriched educational platform for low wealth African American and Latino individuals and communities. By connecting supply chain needs childhood and adolescent development, post high school training programs, internships, and life skills development, Chariot Labs is poised to meet anticipated demand for employment in the upstream, midstream, and downstream segments of oil and gas and petrochemical industries. Chariot Labs provides foundational and functional support for training and allows participating companies to leverage and maximize the value of scarce training resources. Chariot Labs will provide hands-on workshops, lab visits, outreach to the community, and mentored internships for low-wealth students and their faculty. Chariot Labs also will support energy education in the post-secondary setting to increase student opportunities to enter the energy workforce. Diverse strategic partnerships with community-based organi organizations, industry participants, governmental agencies, and educational institutions positions Chariot Labs <clears throat> excuse me, to be at the forefront of energy-related activities as the energy economy expands in the Philadelphia region. For example, Chariot has been working with the American Association of Blacks in Energy, Marcella Shale Coalition, Drexel University, the Philadelphia Foundation, the Wharton Initiative of Global I Environmental Leadership, Wharton Social Impact Initiative, Southeastern Pennsylvania Big Brothers and Big Sisters, United Bank of Philadelphia, Liberty Energy Trust, PICO, and other industry participants, community-based organizations, and government agencies to identify the skills and credentials required for in-demand jobs and to assist in the development and refinement of education and training programs at Chariot Labs. In fact, on October 1st, Chariot hosted Governor Corbett at the Union League alongside 30 African-American and Latino business and community leaders in Philadelphia to discuss our business strategies. I'm going to briefly uh, go through a few of our programming initiatives, the first of which is the Chariot Energy Academy. The Chariot Energy Academy is a free six-week summer camp for low-wealth children between the ages of 12 and 16 years old, designed to introduce middle school and high school aged children to energy fundamentals and will feature energy, education, and subject matter experts, an intensive curriculum of interactive lectures, presentations, class assignments, Field trips and a research project focusing on sustainable energy will be a part of the curriculum. The Academy will introduce 50 young people of color to the possibilities that exist in the energy industry when they study science, engineering, arts, and technology. The Academy will commence operations in June of 2015, and the program is under development and will be available to share with City Council upon your request because we put a lot of work and effort into this in the last five years. Additionally, we've created I'm going to talk about the Utility Trust Fund. The energy burden of working class families is often three or four times what it is for the middle income household. They have to spend as much as 20% of their monthly income on utilities compared to four or 5% for the national average household. Many of these working class families are already hard pressed to pay for increasing health care costs while feeding their families, making rent or mortgage payments, and paying disproportionately high transportation costs. Many factors contribute to this pervasive problem, including lack of jobs, lack of livable wages, lack of quality education, and lack of quality health care. By collaborating with our strategic partners, Chariot has embarked upon an innovative strategy to reduce the energy burden of low-wealth families throughout its develop through its development of the first ever statewide utility trust fund in the United States. 
Pennsylvania receives approximately $16 million each year from the federal government under the Low Income Home Energy Affordability Program. In 2001, Pennsylvania utilities lost approximately $400 million in write-offs to low-income populations. The UTF will be capitalized with $200 million coming from government, industry participants, and private foundations and other sources. It is anticipated that the UTF will generate $20 million annually, or 125% of the annual federal allocation. Using the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services calculations of $250 of a $250 cash benefit per family, the Utility Trust Fund will assist sustainably annually an additional nearly 87,000 working class families each year by providing emergency cash assistance payments to keep the heat on during the winter months. This innovative, sustainable, and cost-effective investment into the Utility Trust Fund is not a giveaway program but rather a win-win situation for PGW's 150,000 low-wealth families, the City of Philadelphia, and the Commonwealth. Having introduced Chariot, I hope that you will not mind if I conclude briefly by introducing myself. I was born in Philadelphia. I grew up in Mount Airy. My family lives in Philadelphia. My stepfather worked as a counselor for the Philadelphia Youth Study Center for 30 years, and my company's headquartered here. I've never forgotten and will never forget where I come from, or the people and the communities that I represent. I'm engaged in economic development and social impact. Every aspect of Chariot Company speaks this language and embodies those values. But we are more than that. We are part of the solutions economy, providing thought leadership and innovation to seemingly disconnected issues. I'm a possibilitarian, and I see great possibilities for Philadelphia to be the next energy hub. There's an old African proverb that states, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. If you want to walk far, walk together. I invite everyone in this room to walk far and wide, together, as we select the best course of action for the disposition of PGW and, and the creation of an energy hub that benefits all Philadelphians. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I have a couple of members who have questions, but I want to jump in right quick. I want to ask uh, Mr. Ryan a couple of questions, and I believe both, both of your companies responded to the RFP from the administration. Am I correct? Um, I'm not really at liberty to discuss that. That may, that may be a part of why <laughs> the problem. <laughs> All right. I, I probably know that, but okay. Uh, so I guess. All right. I think it's in the public that, domain that, that, that we that were in answer, the process. That answer, and I didn't know that you were going to respond that way, but that response speaks volumes about this process. Uh, okay. Um, Mr. Breyer, are you? No. Can you respond on the record? Um, I mean, that, that, you, you, I know they can't respond, but can they tell us why they can't respond, Mr. Yeah, President? Uh, you know what? They have a reason why, and Councilman. that might be good to get out there. Councilman, um, if you could tee up, because okay. I'm, I'm seeing this, this trend in the press, like whenever I say something, it takes on a different light in the press. Gotcha. So no I would problem, prefer that you ask the question. Thank it's you, like sir. Clark against the, the mayor, and I, I just don't want to keep playing that little whatever. Yeah, I'm like, you know, it's like, uh, Ms. Ryan, can, can you also not answer that question? I think all I can say is there's certainly stuff in the public domain in the press that would seem to indicate we were, but if I was going to answer the question formally, I'd probably have to answer it the same way same as John. Thing. Okay. All right. And I was asking that not because of that. I thought, I actually thought the response would be different. So the issue with respects to the presentation made by both of you talked about public-private partnership. And we do know, and I guess we can acknowledge that, and you kind of acknowledge that the RFP did not allow a public-private partnership response. Can you answer that? Yeah. Point of order. Can you please repeat your question, Mr. President? My, my question is, is did the RFP allow, 
either you or anyone else to, to submit a response that had a public-private par partnership as a part of your proposal? I think the, um, I mean, certainly, uh, if, if I think the most constructive answer I can give is that if you look at the way we went about trying to look at the opportunity, uh, the first thing we did was try and take a stakeholder approach. That's why we started talking to, uh, to labor. We actually had meetings with Chariot and other groups um, to, uh, to, to identify who the stakeholders were and to think about how they would be included. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it certainly wasn't, um, that was our initiative. That was something we were doing. That didn't come out of any process that we were part of. Okay. All right. We, we, one, the, ask, the reason I asked the question, um, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this in public. I'm, I'm, I'm not used to that. We kind of. <laughs> when we do our business, we have to be in this room and we have to be on TV, actually, because there's actually cameras. <laughs> yeah, right, right, Councilman. So, open and transparent. Uh, man, I'm, I'm it kind of caught me at a, having somewhat of a dilemma. So, the reason I asked that question, I guess because of the level of interest from your companies, I can say that, right? Can I say that? All right, I know that there were a number of individuals that were in the room yesterday and who have voiced their concerns about this particular issue of the PGW sale who were actually supportive of your organization um, as it related to whatever process that you all may or may not have been involved with. So I guess when I see that, I guess it kind of, if they, they have such credibility as it relates to the proposed sale, then they're probably, the fact that they were supportive of your proposal or whatever you were involved with, um, I guess that gives you all some level of credibility. We, if, I'll tell you the, the one thing that, um is uh, always useful is to actually look at something that happened as opposed to theory. And, you know, I think one of the, um, uh, a, a good thing in terms of our background in an example is if you look at um, the, uh, the arrangements that were made in Chicago. So while I, I made a, the point in my testimony that Chicago doesn't have the things going for it that Philly does. You know, Philly's this big, uh, vibrant city with some of the best financial institu uh, educational institutions in the world kind of sandwiched in between this gas development and a logistics center on the port. So we're in the right spot. However, in Chicago, when they decided to, uh, to do something, they really did it while it's characterized as a sale is what really should be characterized as a public-private partnership. So in that, in that uh, uh, project that Boris led in Chicago, the city retained a concession that gave the city influence over and the ability to ensure that the social programs were protected. And uh, alongside uh, bringing in private capital and, and, and uh, replacing their cast iron, because they had a cast iron replacement issue just like we do here. And, and the, the gist of it is that it was all about modernizing the network. Uh, so, you know, uh, you can't just build a pipe um, to the existing network and problem solved. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, it's gotta be an integrated solution um, that obviously puts safety first, as I said in my testimony. But I think the, the answer I would throw back is that one thing that made it easy for us as we started the process of talking to stakeholders was that if they ever had questions about whether we were for real um, and whether or not um, they could trust us and whether we were credible, we always recommended they call people in Chicago. Call the union in Chicago, ask them. You know, uh, call the community groups in Chicago, ask them. Uh, you know, did it go down the way, uh, the way you, they were told? And I think that was a real good starting point for us in, um, in, in opening up the subject to people about how we wanted to approach uh, work in the, the gas distribution sector in Philly. Okay. All right, I can't. Under the current Councilwoman Tasco. Um, let's just go back to um, the RFP process is a public document. In, and so you, you can say whether or not 
it was geared to a sale only or public private entity? What were you asked to respond to? If you tell me it's okay, it's okay. It, it was geared towards a straight up sale. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. I said it was geared towards a straight up sale. In fact, if you look at the Lazard report that's public, the Lazard report that sort of set the table for it said that the transaction should be uh, based on synergies. So, and, job cutting. And that's my understanding as well. All right. Councilwoman Tasco's been around a little bit longer than me. She knows how to get to the. <laughs> um, I was over here fumbling at the mic and she went right to it. Um, now, I only asked that question because, and I think I knew the answer, but, you know, it's going to come from you guys that, you know, I heard what you said today, and it piqued my interest because not only the fact of the public-private partnership, but the notion that people engaged in the conversation from your, on your end, your perspective, were people that actually talked about broadening the energy opportunities uh, around the city of Philadelphia and knowing some of the people that had it shown some level of support for your proposal, those people actually were a part of that process and want to continue to be a process and actually pushing the notion of us creating a significant energy hub. So that's why I was asking the question. Um, and I, again, I should have been like Councilwoman Tasco, going straight to the chase. Uh, okay, I'm good. All right, thank you. Um, Chair recognizes Councilwoman Squill. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question, I guess, is a little different. It seems like, is there a difference between a publicly run company and a publicly owned company as far as the abilities to create more opportunities or borrow money or things like that? So the uh, uh, publicly owned company has to report its earnings to Wall Street every quarter. Um, and is under a lot of pressure to, uh, to deliver every quarter um, a, uh, a result. And um, the, the, one of the reasons that you often see, in, in particularly in energy infrastructure, the uh, capital is private capital, it's longer term capital, is that it doesn't have that same, uh, same requirement. Um, certainly for us, one of the most important things, because while I, I said in my testimony that we need to change the status quo, on the other hand, if you think about how sensitive an asset like this is, um, we also felt that one of the, the ways that we could create connections to the different stakeholders was have the core of our equity, the core of our, of our capital base be Philadelphia investors. So we raised $200 million from local, uh, locally based investors who are all civically engaged, very active people in the community with the idea that A, you know their capital's long term, they live here, you know, they're not going anywhere. Uh, second, uh, they don't report to Wall Street. They, uh, they're, they're private uh, investors. Um, and then the other part of it was then we felt that having them uh, in, in, in charge of the governance, it would create an opportunity for people to be much more comfortable with a new, a new uh, actor at the table. But uh, the idea behind the private-public partnership is that not only can you get access to that long-term capital, but you don't have to give up uh, leaving the city uh, with a voice. Um, with a veto over certain decisions and with a, a voice, uh, really a, a dominant voice in governance on the issues that, they're, uh, that they care about. Um, when you talk about that too, do you think that adds additional hurdles for a company if it's a public-private partnership compared to just a privately owned company? No, I, I, I think um, you know, again, it, it, if think about hurdles, if you take this case of Chicago, that while it had this concession component to it, really arguably is a, a, a P3, um, from uh, start to finish, that process took six months. Um, and obviously, the, uh, the devil's in the details. Um, you know, clearly uh, there are other uh, regulatory bodies involved, like the PUC, et cetera, that set the rates. But uh, fundamentally, um, and, and as I, I also would point out, there, there are, uh, certainly parts of the, uh, the energy infrastructure in the city currently that aren't, aren't under the POC, like the LNG opportunity, CNG, those aren't regulated assets. Those are things you could do very, very quickly without, um, without necessarily uh, having uh, to go through a, a separate regulatory process. 
So you, you believe then the timeline to turn things around could still happen quickly in, in a partnership um, as separated or different than maybe a privately or publicly owned company having the opportunity to do it? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Chair recognizes Councilman Reynolds Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm uh, quite uh, intrigued and incited by your testimony. And um, to President Clark's credit, the value in us exploring the breadth and depth of energy hubs. So to follow up on Councilman Squilla's question, is it reasonable to believe that we could achieve some if or all of the goals from a public-private partnership that have been articulated in a straight-up sale with PGW? Could we get to the same end in some way with the public-private partnership? I actually think we get to a better place um, because the, the, the reality is that um, these uh, as I was saying before, status quo is unacceptable, I don't think. I think that we, we just can't miss this opportunity to, uh, to take our spot in this growing energy economy. And, and if I could just ask you to pause there, Council President and members of Council have said that from square one. So we're, we're all singing from the same sheet of music on that particular issue. On the other side is you can't go off um, uh, and, and ignore the fact that there's a lot of stakeholders that need to be given some comfort that they're going to be protected. Um, and, uh, and that's why I think in the case of a public-private partnership, it's a perfect model for introducing this long-term private capital, this uh, private sector expertise, while at the same time leaving the city uh, involved in a way that allows them to protect the constituencies that are going to only trust the city to protect them. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilwoman Sanchez also used, you asked a question, winners and losers. Who could, if any, be the potential losers and a public-private partnership? Well, it would be probably fewer fees for Wall Street, um, but, uh, but I, I'm, I'm sorry to joke. I, I think that, I think the, uh, the um, you know, the, 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 the truth is that, um, you know, at this point, and, and I, I, you know, I, I don't like the fact that there's all this cast iron out there. You know, uh, uh, I think that the safety issue is the first reason why uh, uh, I would be very uh, pleased to be involved in something to expedite replacing that. Um, but uh, in terms of public-private partnership, I think the, uh, the, the, it is the appropriate way to make sure you balance these different uh, claims and, uh, and uh, protect the, the interests of different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, to gentlemen um, to chariot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Speak more, if you would, about the Chariot Energy Academy. Well, yes, the, we've been working on the Chariot Energy Academy. We felt that it was very important um, and meeting with several stakeholders uh, throughout the past several years. It was really important to anchor any activity with respect to PGW and the energy hub concepts into helping low wealth communities. Uh, we've been working with um, you know, Drexel University and others um, and cultivating that programming piece. But essentially, it's we know that well, at least we believe that Philadelphia is going to become an energy hub. So ultimately, how do we protect the 30% of the folks, that, or the 20 to 30% of the, uh, the, uh, the population of Philadelphia that, that live in poverty? How do we get them to participate in the process such that we can give them opportunities to have livable wages? And ultimately, that's where it came from. That's where it derives from. We have a lot of uh, collaborative relationships and strategic partnerships with industry participants the academic community and, and community, de uh, community uh, development entities mm -hmm. uh, throughout the Philadelphia area all coming together collaboratively sure. uh, to develop that model. And I would welcome, you know, working with, with the city council and others to, uh, to bring critical mass to that because we've done a lot of the heavy lift um, in terms of the infrastructure and that programming model. This very issue was raised uh, this week in a uh, wonderful hearing led by um, Councilwoman Cindy Bass about how we are mindful not to leave people behind. I mean, Van Jones, formerly of the, the President Barack Obama's energy czar, talked about this very, very issue. So to, to know that there are entities like yours in the city that get this already, it really behooves us, if we're serious about reducing poverty, that we bring people along, particularly that 25% that, and that, that poverty 
population. Who are the lucky 50 kids and how, you, how, how do you get them? Um, we are, in fact, that, we are working with several folks. In fact, um, you know, Drexel University has, has the baseline or the, uh, the anchored uh, educational program through the Promise Zone. So they're already doing things with the McMichael School right now um, in and, and West Philadelphia. The unique thing about what Chariot does is we identify what they're doing and said, hey, look, we can build off of that to scale it differently. So that's why we brought other uh, stakeholders into the, into the mix, uh, industry participants, get, you know, uh, University of Pennsylvania, perhaps Temple University, City College of Philadelphia, and others to join in that dialogue and discussion to really get a consensus as to what's the academic, uh, you know, reality is, how do we help these folks? And that's why we have a broad coalition. So they bring in, are these meds and eds bringing dollars to the table, or are they bringing sweat equity in terms of uh, staff? What are they bringing to the table? Uh, they're bringing, well, they have, they're bringing some staff. Uh, they have programming and teachers and faculty um, already in place. Um, in fact, I believe that they have received uh, a grant from PICO uh, in furtherance of their activities. Um, that's my understanding. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of what it is. Well, uh, I'm not going to... Um I'm going to honor the clock. Okay. <laughs> Mr. President, my thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Chair Ragnar, Councilman Heenan. Thank you, Council President. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you for coming in. A uh, couple of questions. So over the last, it's been interesting uh, for us, to say the least, and, and there's many opinions out there on, on how people feel about the process, but, but here we are, and we're talking about the energy hub. All right, in this, in this, in Philadelphia and in a region, and the synergy coming from here, uh, there has been, uh, there's, I mean, first and foremost, we do have what it takes as a cluster to become an energy club. We have the transportation, we have, you know, in, in the various different ways, we have uh, opportunities for partnerships. And, you know, one thing I've learned over, you were talking to, you know, our, my colleague, uh, Ken, Councilwoman Blondell Reynolds Brown talking about national energy, you know, with 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 our president. But you talk about some national buzzwords that maybe not have been, um, you know, like fiscal cliff and all these other buzzwords that that have taken place over the last couple. Of, so now it's P3. All right. So we we've we've branded P3 as uh, as a topic of conversation moving forward, and you know, for me. It's about making sure that we prepare ourselves for this energy hub for economic development growth and, and employing people and taking care of people, all our people as citizens of Philadelphia, uh, in every neighborhood for every possible situation that it currently exists. So could you explain to me, because I'm, um, I'm, I'm interested in you know, you, you know there, there's been some mention about, you know, about the workers. We all worry about the workers. You know, does the P3 economic development opportunities for an energy hub grow our workforce here? I think it's uh, without question the case. It's, it's um, if, you, if you go through some of those examples that um, I was citing, between expanding the LNG facilities, expanding the CNG, uh, converting, um, the uh, the transportation that comes through the city to uh, to gas. Um, you know, Philadelphia has got the largest perishables port um, in the country. Um, all of the uh, standards for the shipping industry are forcing them to shift to uh, lower carbon emission fuels. They're all converting to gas. Um, if you think about uh, the uh, the ability of private capital to expedite replacing this cast iron pipe. Um, there uh, are a lot of ways in which what we will be talking about here is a growing pie about having to employ um, a lot more people uh, quickly. And, um, and I, I, so the answer would be a definite, absolute yes. So uh, private, private company, private industry, uh, and a municipal, does either one they're all, are they both subject to PUC approval for programs, for rate increases, and, and such forth? Well, definitely with the, uh, with the, the, the distribution of gas, um, that's going to be subject to PUC oversight in terms of rates, no matter whether it's public or private. So even like today, so public or private, that, they're going to cover that. 
regulates the distribution of gas. The distribution of gas. However, some of the activities in the Which energy is saturated in, in in the Philadelphia area. I mean, how I've learned, it's not totally saturated. I mean, I think, of, you know, from what I heard yesterday, maybe 80, 85 percent. But there is there is possible growth opportunity. Well, you know, it, first of all, th there's growth in the non-regulated, like the LNG and the CNG, but there's a big opportunity in the regulated too. So one of the reasons that you don't have more of these CHPs in the city, these combined heat power plants, so those things, uh, uh, a regular uh, electricity plant will only use 30% of the energy in the gas. You put in a CHP, you're gonna get 90% of the energy out of that gas. And the, uh, there's one on the roof of the Four Seasons. The, uh, the, one of the reasons that we can't put more of these CHPs into the city is because the current network is low pressure. So one of the benefits of tweaking a bit the way you'd replace that cast iron would be to create pieces of the network um, where you could increase the pressure. And within those areas, you'd be able to uh, invest in putting in more of these CHPs, which definitely means more jobs. It means more, uh, more work for the trades. It, it's a win-win. It's a, it's a Oh, and so, it lowers rates, too, because you're putting through more gas? It, it, through it ultimately, in, 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 let me, let me, well, that's a, that's a good question. So yesterday, PGW, and as we know, it's a municipally owned uh, uh, utility, so the money goes back, lowering the cost for rate payers. In the P3 opportunities, would they have that same sort of uh, arrangement or opportunities? Yeah, I think, I think that, that's where ultimately, the when we increase our energy efficiencies, we want to, you know, pass it back, you know, to the citizens who are using it, right, and, and the businesses that... that and, that, and that's actually where the PUC regulatory framework comes into play, because the way that would work would be as you had uh, more volumes going through the infrastructure, it would mean on the margin you'd have lower rates for people, and then it's the PUC that kind of regulates how, um, how that gets, uh, uh, gets it allocated and how the tariffs are structured, but basically the fundamental point would be if you could increase the throughput, it would reduce rates for people. Madam, can I ask my question and then I'll be it, that'll be it for, so uh, my, my district, uh, the Sixth Councilmatic District has the LNG plant, right? Most people don't even know that we, we do have an LNG plant, one of the uh, finest LNG plants and largest LNG plants in, in, in the country, uh, represented by our, our gas workers here. Uh, one of the things as we, as we discuss energy hubs and we discuss you know, new business opportunities, we expect PGW expanding its business or, or, or private partnership opportunities, capacity all right, and supplier chain and, and the economic chain of, of, of development. And we were talking about capacity yesterday and uh, Craig White was, was saying that you know, we're at 50% now you know, we can get up to 75%. So we have opportunity to, to grow and, and to build possibly a, a, another plant. But, but he's talking about, and I may be wrong, but he was talking about that there is a demand for three times the amount of what we, what we store now for new businesses for, in that supplier chain, such as uh, PES or Monroe Energy or, or some of these other um, uh, opportunities. Uh, are, are, are we far from reach of uh, expanding that kind of capacity here? Is, are there real opportunities for, for energy to expand, to reach those demands? And are they real demands? Are they short term? I mean, I know this is, it's, it's ongoing. Are they short term uh, demands or, or are they long term demands? I think they're I mean, very can we, much. Can we, can we, are they fixed rates that they're we can very, the, If you're talking about LNG and CNG, they're very long term. You know, the uh, the the economics, uh, leaving aside the environmental externalities, leaving aside the fact that uh, that gas is uh, much better for the environment than obviously coal or, or diesel. Um, even LNG, it's like a five to one benefit against diesel. So pipe gas, it's more like nine to one, um, cheaper. So uh, the, uh, the demand of people today in the region and on the east coast of the U.S. and in Central America and South America for getting access to this uh, cheap gas that's coming out of Pennsylvania is, uh, is, is very large. So there's, there's a high rate of return on the investment. Yeah. I have no further questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hello, how you doing today? Just had a couple of questions. 
one, I want to acknowledge the work of Chariot. Um, I appreciate um, your slightly uh, uniquely approach in addressing the issue of energy, particularly to um, the communities of African Americans and minorities, which uh, sometimes in this type of discussion around energy isn't usually um, traditionally included in these type of discussions. Maybe we talk about gun violence, uh, maybe we talk about schools, maybe we talk about jobs, but mostly when it comes to energy, it's not, has, it hasn't always been one of those areas um, in which the African American minority community has been um, a part of the discussion. So thank you for your work that you have been doing and your dedication thank you. um, to this cause by um, growing up in the city and staying involved and putting this out in the forefront. So I commend you on that. Um, I wanted to um, talk about the P3 uh, with Liberty Trust. I know you guys are looking at doing a proposal and partnering uh, with the city of Philadelphia in a public-private partnership uh, with PGW. And so I just had a couple questions uh, based upon how you did your operations in um, Chicago, because you said one of the best things that you can do is to look at what has been done in the past. Um, at least for me, um, rather it was selling it um, to a private entity or not, my number one concerns were the constituents who will be significantly impacted by um, whether it's the P3 or the privatization of PGW. And that's making sure, uh, one, like the Lahey crisis program that my grandma used stays in place. Um, two, uh, the ability of not kicking off a resident in the dead of winter stays. Um, and so can you give me an idea in Chicago now, in the East, those two social program issues, right, are primarily, Lahey is regulated under the PUC. That's a state jurisdiction. The city of Philadelphia truthfully has nothing to do with it. We can do recommendations, but ultimately at the end of the day, whoever runs the PUC will have some level of influence on if you can eliminate these programs or keep these programs based upon, um, really, um, they can pay attention to our recommendations or not, but they have sole jurisdiction. So I want to get an idea of how did you protect those programs in Chicago? Were they, were they regulated under the state, or did the city have a level of say-so over those social programs in Chicago? Sure. Thank you. First, economic development doesn't have to come at the expense of labor or social program. Uh, Long-term economic development usually comes hand-in-hand -hand with labor and with social program and with communities that support long-term development. Uh, going to Chicago, I was acting in capacity as vice president of corporate development. So I was the front person who was responsible for negotiations, uh, financial plan, business plan for these programs. The key theme in Chicago at this point was the theme of, frankly, getting ready for the Olympic Games. So they were thinking about the Olympic Games and they were thinking to upgrade, to take advantage of this bid and to upgrade infrastructure. And one of the key proposals that we made was not just a proposal how many miles of pipe you replaced, but how you put it into a new integrated network that would meet requirements of the 21st century. In Chicago, we used to joke that vintage of Chicago network and you can still find certain pipe, not with cast iron, used to find pipes, but made with chestnut. Mm -hmm. So these networks were put in place during Abraham Lincoln time. Obviously in PGW, we probably can see some pipes coming from Ben Franklin time. I, I, I'm on a timeline and the president was sure. dean, so I just want to need a yes or no, like in Chicago, what jurisdiction ran the social programs? Was it the state? Or the city? Who city. the city? city. Okay. It was Richard Daly and the city council. Okay. So let's say we engage, fast forward, let's say we do a P3, uh, we do public-private partnership moving forward in the future. Um, how do we go about it? Again, still be the same scenario. State runs these social programs. How would you go about assuring that um, at least you will advocate to make sure that those particular programs, one, Lahey, crisis program, too. You can't just kick a person off in the dead of winter, because you have some Philadelphians that say, why should we subsidize those people to keep their heat on in the dead of winter? Mm -hmm. um, 
How would you go about Think about this, right, the usually there are two level approach. First level approach is a state approach, law approach, legal approach, which gives certain minimum protection. In Philadelphia, social programs are the signature program. We understand that it's core in Philadelphia. Yes. And in Philadelphia, the city would have to be continued to involved in design in and implementation of the social program. So they could be on the board, have a veto right. There's ways you construction yeah. a P3 where they'd have the final say. Cool. And one last component, and I'll, and I'll let the next, um, my next colleague go in the next round. But, I, but also, if you can touch on just uh, how do we go about, do you have any the protection of the environment type of programs that you've done in Chicago to show, okay, we do a P3 uh, with the Philadelphia Gas Company. Here's all the things that we're going to do to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, I know in some parts of my district in the past we had to address the issue of asthma as it relates to certain mm -hmm. sure. companies working in... It's a very in relevant district. question because both cities are non-abatement cities. So in both cities it is a cri critical issue. And you might recall even stories regarding asthma in Chicago. And just to follow up on Charlie's point, uh, transition from fuel oil and diesel oil to natural gas, LNG or CNG, cool. is 85% cleaner. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's it, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Tasco. I just want to be clear on, uh, in talking about the low-income programs, um, the LAHI program is a federal program, federal, and it's run by the state. The programs that we run at PGW, I mean, that would be the public's choice to run those programs, to set up those programs for our customers. So if it's a public-private partnership, then we, the public, have a say in those programs staying. And, and Chair, so, so the LAHI program is federally funded, but is operated, what, through the state? What component does the PUC regulate when it comes to LAHI crisis program? I believe they administer, they administer the, the – This is a federal program, so the PUC is not – They administer the, yeah, the capital from that. It goes to the Department of Public Welfare. That's correct. In fact, we've met with them, um, DPW – Which is still under the state, though, correct? Department of Public Welfare? Is but the PUC has nothing to do with that. Okay. Yeah, they de right. the, the, fed, the federal government delegates to, the, to, the, to DPW, and they administer the program statewide. It's under the state, correct? Yeah, but – the PUC. money comes to the, they appropriate the money to the city. Okay. All right. So but what, through our uh, formulation in, uh, of the utility trust fund, we met with DPW, we met with Robert Powelson back in June of 2012, talking about these, the, you know, how the, the utility trust fund will work. And we've been working with them because ultimately it makes sense. They already run uh, the LIHEAP program now. So, you know, we already have a public private partnership on the books in terms of the utility trust fund to okay. help low wealth communities. All right, just for the record, Madam Chair, I just wanted to make sure that that particular, we utilize that a lot in my district. And so sure. if we hear anything from any of the residents um, regarding PGW in general, that's one of the key programs that I hear advocate, advocates talk about when they come to my office. And then the other component was that ability to not kick individuals off in the day of the winter based upon them not having the ability to pay their gas bill. Okay. They can't do that. They can't do that. No. I'm asking We're these have questions. Our staff come over and brief you the, all the, over. The reason why I'm asking the questions, right, even separate from the briefing, it still has to be a matter of public record. Mm -hmm. Rather, it's these sure. guys I'm talking to or the next group that may be coming. So it should be mentioned just for the record. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome, Council. Council um, I have a question. We probably can get someone from the <laughs> gas works uh, to come over and talk about that, Council, if you like, today. ASAP, 